Today on the Dad the Best I Can show. It caused him to have chronic pain in his ankles for his entire life from that moment moving forward. And it also caused him to lose all of his scholarships. Hmm. And I want to I say real quickly, now that I've said those two things, is that I never heard my father complain once in my life. Hmm. Not about traffic, not about you know the drive through taking too long, not about the waitress not coming back to fill up his water, not about anything. I never heard my father complain. But I also saw my father at, you know, one in the morning when I was a rebellious teenager, hence the name of the sales rebellion, by the way, when I would come back into uh, my, my house, you know, like sneaking in and my dad would be awake, but not like most dads be awake, you know, waiting for their rebellious son to come, come, come home. He was awake because he couldn't sleep because he was in so much pain. And that was a consistency that he had his entire life. Welcome to the Dad the Best I Can show. My name is Rob Roseman, who wants to be a millionaire legend, Chicago futures trader, Vegas poker pro. Now I'm a dad to three kids, ages seven, five, and two. Phew, wears me out just thinking about it. Each week we bring on high-performing dads like you, entrepreneurs like Jesse Itzler, CEOs like David Cancel from Drift.com, Athletes like Ken Rideout, best selling children's authors like Zach Bush, to tell us your stories, your dad tips and tricks to help all of us make it through dad life. We have a brand new website over at dadthebestican.com. Go on over to dadthebestican.com and sign up with your email. It's 100% free, of course. Be the first to hear brand new dad guests and get weekly dad tips in your inbox. Okay, enough out of me. On to today's show. All right, welcome to the Dad the Best I Can show. Today we are lucky to be joined by Dale Dupree. Dale is the leader of the Sales Rebellion. You might know him as the Copier Warrior. He is the host of the Selling Local podcast. And of course, he is a dad. Hey, Dale, how's it going today? What's up, Rob? It's so fun to hear that I'm a dad. <laughs> it's only been a couple of years that I've been a dad. So we used to have inside jokes about how when you could tell that like our friends were getting older because they started to act like your dad, you know, so you would like they would say something like I wouldn't do that if I were you and you'd turn to him and go, OK, dad. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I think you, you, your age is not really indicative, but once you have kids, that is a, a turning point and you do act a little different. But yeah, I still so act like my 27-year-old self, I'd say 90% of the time. <laughs> good. That's a good thing. Right. Uh, where are you calling in from today? Oh, I'm at the little coffee shop down the street from my, my house, actually. It's uh, kind of my go-to spot. It's called Credo. They've got a really interesting setup here, actually, that I could share with the listeners where when you buy coffee here or food or anything, you actually pay whatever you want. So you can pay a dollar or you can pay $10 for a cup of coffee. It's, it's kind of a neat little system, but the guy that founded this place, um, he's faith-based. And so he just is, it's his way of kind of giving back to the community by providing a really quality product, um, but also allowing people to kind of just decide like, how well do you want this place to be maintained? Do you want one ply of toilet paper? Then just pay a dollar and that's all we'll be able to afford. <laughs> so yeah, I cool like little that. spot. I always wonder, I've heard of that technique and it, it does sound really interesting, but I, I've never really heard the business owner talk about it. How do you think he does with the business with that policy? Well, I mean, like in the beginning when I first started, I thought, I don't know that that's sustainable. And, and I'm, I mean, five years ago, I thought for sure, like, we'll never see this go much further than, you know, what it is. But he's got four locations now, I want to say, either three or four. And, you know, he's still going strong, dude. And so I, what I'll say is that it's cool, the kind of culture he's built, which is a very loyal base of people. And then when new people come in and experience it and they see that there, again, that there's a community here, they, they're kind of jealous. They want to be a part of it. So they, they ask questions like, well, what do people normally pay? <laughs> you know, which is interesting, right? Because then essentially you're still dictating what they pay at the end of the day. You're just giving them this choice that they end up trusting back to you in the first place. So. I like that a lot. I think probably most business owners don't have the balls to do it, but it seems so like, true. like you said, it probably does create a very loyal uh, fan base. I guess your fear would be that there will be a hundred homeless people getting coffee for a penny or, 
but <laughs> yeah. well there what's interesting is that there there are some folks that are very needy that do come up here and they they only have a quarter sometimes but that's fine they get yeah. coffee so that's awesome i like this policy uh so you're in florida is that right yep orlando florida and and that is not home of uh the mouse like most people tend to believe the mouse is down in a little town called Kissimmee, or if you're local kiss me uh and it's actually like an old hick town no offense to to hicks out there that are listening but it's a it's an it's kind of a farmland right and uh and that's actually why disney bought so much of the land because <laughs> all the farmers were happy to a you know sell for something more than less than market price right and then also because there was so much land out there in the first place it was uninhabited so orlando is kind of a hidden gem outside of Disney. A lot of people think they're coming to Orlando when they visit and they end up completely missing out on the, all the culture, all the food, all the experiences that you can get from our, our fun little city. Yeah, I grew up in South Florida, so we made many trips. And actually, we were just down there for Thanksgiving. We took the minivan through everybody in there, three kids. It was a, a long ride, but we stopped in Orlando. And I was telling my kids on the way down that Florida is like 12 different states, essentially. Orlando's got one, South Florida, the Panhandle. So when everybody lumps Florida all together, I kind of uh, take a little take a little umbrage with that and say, well, which part of Florida? Yeah, it is interesting. It is interesting. And so what, what you said South Florida, but what part of South Florida? So I grew up in Miami and um, after that just went to college. I'm a Gator. So I was in Gainesville for a few cool. years. Go Gators. Yes. Yes. So some good times down there, but yes, love awesome. Florida, especially this time of year. Yeah, for sure. It, it is, bro. Anybody listening right now, they should all know that it's like 76 degrees outside. It's sunny. Uh, and it's beautiful. The few, I think the humidity is at 40 something percent instead of 90 like it is in the summer. So welcome to Florida. This is yes. the weather. <laughs> I think all all the old retirees have figured this out long ago. <laughs> yeah, uh... they really truly have, bro. But that's why, we're, I, that's why I'm saying it. The young generation needs to hear what they're missing out on. Come on, guys, come visit. Yeah, I lived in Chicago for seven years. And while I loved it, and it's one of the best cities in the world, I'm like, I don't know how people do this forever. It's you True. guys are, do you know yeah. what's down there? It's warm and palm trees and fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Dale. So how old are your kids now? So I have one and he's, he's going on two. He's a few months away from being two years old. Two. I've got a two and a half year old. And I think I, I you know, I have a seven year old and a five year old. I've forgotten all of this. But that right before two, I feel like can be some of the most challenging times because they can't really communicate. So props to you. You're going through it right now. And yeah. once <laughs> once he starts talking, it's like a, right. it's it's a good times ahead. Yeah, for sure. He he kind of, you know, he talks a little bit, but it's it is fun because I, I feel like he and not to make everybody listening really upset with me, but he sleeps until like eight o'clock and, <laughs> and he has for quite some time now, but what's really been cool. And the, and I'm, I don't think my wife thinks it's that cool, but what I've thought is really cool is that I typically am done with my, my morning routine at about five thirty, five forty five Cause I wake up about four thirty, and, and I, and at that point I still have a routine that I'm going through, but it involves kind of like going back to the house because I leave the house in the morning first thing. And it kind of involves coming back and um, just kind of spending some time with myself. And I think my son knows, has like figured out that there's like this window in the morning between 6.30 and 7 that I'm I'm awake and that he can come see me. And so he wakes up now <laughs> around that time. And, and so my, it's funny because my wife just kind of gets him uh, because I'll be, I'll be technically getting ready to leave the house again to head up to, you know, wherever I'm working out of or specifically wherever I'm training at for the day. And she'll just grab him and literally put him, you know, wherever I am and go back to bed. <laughs> so nice. I get to spend a little bit of time with him. But I, I really truly believe that you know, a lot of people talk about you can't get this time back. But what we should really be looking and thinking about is, is, is not like how other people say that to us or or how important the subject is in, in general uh, as a generalization i should say as much as it is to us like what do we even care right do we when when we get to to, to 50 60 years old and we're talking to somebody that just had their first son or daughter and we say to them this you'll never get this time back like do we think and go i did a really good job during that time 
I was very intentional during that time. I didn't get frustrated. I wasn't manipulated by, you know, the concept of like how the world would say it's okay to be angry about your son waking you up that early in the morning, right? Or did I make my own decisions during this time? I think that that's what's been the most challenging and also the most fun for myself because I've looked at it differently. And the big reason is because, as you know, Rob, I don't have a dad anymore and he was my best friend. And so I look at my son as my this is my chance to get to give back to my father. Yeah, that's a great segue too. I mean, I came across you on LinkedIn, which I do want to talk about later, but I found your article and then your podcast and video where you did talk about your dad who passed away and your relationship with him. Um, Could you tell the listeners out there a little bit about your father's story? Sure. Of course. Yeah. My, my dad's story is compelling and it's one of a, it's a hero story as I like to look at it. My dad had a very bright future ahead of him right out of high school into college where he was a football player and one of the best, he was the most feared defensive linebacker in all of central Florida. You couldn't go to a school and interview a quarterback without them saying, I, this guy scares me. He sacks, <laughs> he sacks me too much, whatever the case may have been, but he, he had scholarships to Clemson and Auburn and Florida state and you name it. I mean, all the the top tier schools at the time ended up having this surgery that was at the time was very popular and it kind of stretched your Achilles. I am not still not like super keen or understanding of what the surgery was even to this day and how many times I've heard the dang story. Right. (laughs) But, but basically it was botched. Like the, the surgery was fake and it was botched in the process. So it actually, it caused him to have chronic pain in his ankles for his entire life from that moment moving forward. And it also caused him to lose all of his scholarships. Hmm. And I want to, I want to say real quickly, now that I've said those two things is that I never heard my father complain once in my life, Hmm. not about traffic, not about, you know, the drive through taking too long, not about the waitress, not coming back to fill up his water, not about anything. I never heard my father complain, but I also saw my father at, you know, one in the morning when I was a rebellious teenager, hence the name of the sales rebellion, by the way, when I would come back into uh, my, my house, you know, like sneaking in and my dad would be awake, but not like most dads be awake, you know, waiting for their rebellious son to come, come, come home. He was awake because he couldn't sleep because he was in so much pain. And that was a consistency that he had his entire life. And again, you know, he woke up at 5 30, 5 AM and, and was out of the house by six, six thirty, um, to the office working his butt off so that he could be home to spend time with us by five, five thirty in the evening. And, you know, I, I look at that part of the story, just my father and the way that he cherished us with everything that he had against him in his life, right? Losing these scholarships, having to kind of pivot. Uh, He ended up at Carson Newman. He blew his knees out at Carson Newman, by the way. So he ended up just completely ruining any kind of sports career at that point. And, uh, you know, he tells the story. He says, so I finished up at school and I came home, but he was two years into a four-year degree. And so he, he didn't finish. You know, my dad was a college dropout, basically. And so he came home and he started selling paper like Dunder Mifflin plus, right. And this is back in the seventies. And, and so he, he's selling paper and he becomes so good at it that they buy him a van and then they say, well, why don't you sell these copiers too? And that at the time, you know, for all the copier people listening, they'll, they'll, some of them will re- re- remember or have heard the stories right at the past where there was only a couple segments of copiers. They were speeds basically. And then, you know, when color machines were released, you could have, you know, literally one color copier that was, it was like the only one in the line, you know? So if you wanted color, you had to get this 80 page per minute color copier, right? Like there was no options for a little desktop printer or anything like that. Right. So my dad was given freedom to sell every single segment because he was so good at selling paper, which was unheard of. Most of the time you had to go through all this rigorous training and do all these, you know, dot all these I's, cross all these T's kind of concept. But within, I think it was about four total years, my dad was speaking on behalf of Xerox, um, you know, all over the place, you know, doing trainings on their system and how to sell copiers. Um, and, and then he started his own business in 1984. I was born a year later with toner running through my veins because my <laughs> father made that part of his legacy and his existence. And he, and he pursued all of us to have that same legendary mindset and whatever it was, that we decided to choose in our walk, right? So one thing that people don't know, or maybe they do, because they've looked into me too much, you creeps, um, is that I, I played in a, in a metal band and I toured all over the United States. And, and I was on a major record label at one point in that band as well too. And my father supported 
every moment of it, even though I, I turned down my own scholarships to go to college and, and to get a degree um, to do it. You know, 17 years old, I was graduating from high school and I basically hit the road. And, and my dad's story is one of, of really what it is, is of compassion, of empathy and of understanding, but also loyalty. He was super loyal to me in those moments where I think some parents even listening would be like, I, I don't know what I would do if my kid dyed his hair, pierced his ears, you know, the size of, you know, a penny. And then he, he got tattoos all over his body and started playing music with a bunch of rough riders. Right. I mean, they, I think most parents would hear that oh, I'm saying right now and just be like, God help me if that ever happens. But <laughs> my father embraced it and, and he supported me. And because of that, I have the success I have today because I had clarity. I wasn't on the road doing the things that most people would typically tell you stories about. I was the guy in the corner that was kind of just like, I'm here, I'm here to learn. I'm here to love. I'm here to, to create a career for myself. And those are all attributes that my father pressed into me. Even if I would tell you at 18 years old or even 21 years old that I'll never be like my dad. I'm not going to be like him when I grow up, right? I'm not going to do these things that, that he does, right? Now, I remember the first time that I, I regretted all those things, right? Mm -hmm. I remember the first time that I sat back and thought, man, what a jerk, <laughs> I am, <laughs> you know, so I think my dad's story and the reason I, I, I kind of comb it into mine is because my father always wanted his legacy to be his children. Then he did it, you know, because we are all his biggest fans. We talk about him daily. We live our lives based on the morals and principles and ethics that he built into us, you know, and here we are today on a podcast talking about him. Yeah, that, that is so awesome to hear. And I mean, like you were saying, he was modeling this behavior for you. And that's something we talk a lot about on the podcast is easy to tell your kids what to do, but harder to, you know, support them when they want to go join the rock band right. and those kind of things. So you really did. I wonder where he learned that from, if it was from his dad or if he kind of broke the chain. That's, an, that's an incredible. Yeah, you know, I, I would be, I'm speculating a little bit here, but, but you know, I was very intentional in the way that I listened to my father's stories. And so what, what I would say is that my dad respected his father immensely. You know, I can still remember my father, my grandfather's funeral and, and the, the sadness in my father's face, even though he was absolute, what a leader, man. I mean, he just, he was a solid rock during those moments, even though he, he wasn't afraid to show vulnerability and just to shed a tear in the moment as well, too. He was a leader through it, you know, and held us and, and proclaim victory, like regardless of what was happening, you know, that we were going to rise above this as a family and that we were going to continue his legacy, the legacy of my grandfather. My grandfather was in sales too, Nabisco. He was one of the top reps. I, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite memories is when he retired in the pension plan, right? Like this is a real thing. He could go back to the warehouse with a box, right? So he would just grab a box, head to the warehouse and as many things as he could put in that box, he could leave with. And so he would just <laughs> fill it up with, you know, all your favorite Nabisco treats, right? Chips Ahoy was my game. So anybody listening that's like, yeah, baby, like that was my game. Little glass of milk, little Chips Ahoy. Oh, that, yeah. that was, that was my favorite. So, you know, so I got to experience a different side of my grandfather though. My grandfather was military. He was very stern with my dad um, in the way that he raised him. And my father was pretty rebellious as, as I was, right? But in a kind of in a different way where his dad wasn't so empathetic with him. You know, he didn't necessarily beat my dad up by any means, but, but he was old school in the way that he raised them. And, and I think that that's part of the generational gap as well too, Rob, is this concept that like we sit back and we look and we say, well, he didn't raise him right. Look, look, everybody listening needs to understand that what you're going through right now is like nothing that people went through 50 years ago. And, and so you can't sit back and say that somehow because somebody was raised a little bit differently that they were raised incorrectly by mm -hmm. any means. But what I think what was great about my grandfather is that we never saw any of that. And I think it was almost like his, his chance to do it again. Right. My grandfather gifted me my, my first car. Um, I was 17. I had just gotten my, my learner's permit and he had gifted me the, the blue Dodge caravan. We called it the band van. That's what I would pack all of our stuff in and head out to the, you know, the local shows here in, in town before we got, became a touring band and got a 15 passenger. But he, he gifted me my first rifle that I, that I used to hunt with. You know, it, my, my grandfather was somebody that he, he believed in, in experiences and emotion. And so I think that that's what my father pulled from it more than anything. It was like the core principles and foundations of his upbringing. And like my dad's story is filled with people doing him wrong and my dad initiating 
a conversation with them afterwards to apologize to them for feeling ill will in those moments. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wild to think? And like, and there was times when I was a kid that I thought, and, and I, when I say kid, I mean a teenager, a young adult that I thought, dad, like, why are we, why are we forgiving these people? This is terrible what they've done to you. And, and I mean like every, every single time, Rob, my dad would, would just stoically kind of respond with, no, Dale, it's not about what they did to us. It's about how we show them love within what it is that's happening because of their actions. They'll realize for themselves whether or not they could have done it differently. It's not our place. Our place is to love them. So, you know, that was kind of the bottom line with his upbringing and how it, I, I believe it molded him. That's incredible. I mean, what, an, what a great example for you and now that you can pass along to your kids. That's a, incredible. And his legacy, you know, is right there with you and now with his grandson. Let's take a quick break for our dad tip of the week brought to you by Kickstart Reading. Do you have kids between the ages of three and six? I've got two boys, and when my older son was going into kindergarten, my wife and I quickly learned that we had no idea how to teach him how to read. We found Kickstart Reading and watched one two-minute video together, and you could see his confidence take off. Bonus, I felt like dad of the year. Here's another dad talking about how Kickstart Reading is helping his boys learn how to read. Hey there, this is Chris Heller, and I'm a big fan of Kickstart Reading. Each morning before school, I show a video to my four-and-a-half-year-old son, and now his little two-year-old brother is getting in on the action as well. I'm a big fan of the videos. Highly consumable and engaging for young boys. Definite recommend for all parents out there who are looking to get their kids off to the right start with reading. Kickstart Reading. Go to kickstartreading.com and use the code DAD to get 65% off right now. That's D-A-D, -D, DAD. See? It works. Kickstartreading.com. Now back to the show. Dale, on the Dad the Best I Can show, we like to do one dad tip. You've already given us a bunch from your dad and grandfather. Can you give other dads out there a dad tip? Yeah, so I I want to give this tip a little bit differently than how people typically give them on the show. And hopefully this isn't like too rebellious of me, but that's what I do, right? So my tip would be this. I, I think a lot about, you know, what am I going to do with my son? Like when this situation arises or, you know, if this should happen. And I think it's really important to be proactive with the way that you're raising your kids 100%. I think that that's a good mindset. Um, but also there's this thing of peace and, the, and the, of acceptance in what's happening in this child's life because they're figuring their own shit out for lack of a better term. And hopefully you can say that on this podcast, oh, yes. oh, yeah. but, but, uh, but the idea here is, is how are we, how are we nurturing leaders, right? Not how are we imposing our will onto our kids to make sure that they don't have the same problems we did. And so I think my advice is this, is that recently I was talking to one of my best friends and he was explaining, you know, that one of his roles in his daughter's lives is to be somebody that essentially helps them to right the ship, you know? So like when they do something wrong to sit with them and say, okay, so that was wrong, but what are we going to do better next time? And in my, my, my thought is this, when I would do something wrong, my dad would come to me and just listen. He wouldn't come to me and say, what'd you do? And what'd you learn from it? He would just listen. He would listen and he would be empathetic inside of that situation. And he would understand this fact, bro, which is that at 18 years old and even at 21 years old, there is no one on this earth that, that has it all figured out or that is so self-aware and situationally aware that they can take advice from a father or a father figure and, and somehow compute that and change their life in that moment right? What, what happens is, is that when you, when you, like, when you travel back in time and tell your 18 year old self, the one thing that you, you know, you, you wish you knew your 18 year old self in that moment looks you dead in the eye, it, like turns around in silence, gets in his car, chugs a beer, throws it out the window, like does a donut in the driveway, flicks you off and just drives away. Right. Because that's who we are. Right. And we have to come to this. I think we have to come to these terms that our children are literally clones of us mm -hmm. and and it so it doesn't and it doesn't really matter how proactive we are about what we think is going to happen or occur what we what we know has happened or occurred with us it's about their journey and and so really my tip is to enjoy 
all the suck <laughs> just embrace it and enjoy it and and the thing is is that there might be tears in that enjoyment in some time in some cases i know there was with my dad and i because i went through some pretty rough things at a couple points in my life but but i always could count on my father to listen and i think when i came to a realization that my dad would never judge my dad would never give advice that was unwarranted you know because a lot of us think that way right we're like oh god i don't want to tell my dad because he's going to say these things that I know he's going to say already, right? It's, it's just like this giant stereotype <laughs> that we live in, right? So, mm -hmm. so just embrace it. And just listen. Just love. Just let them figure out for themselves how they're going to rise from the occasion. I love that. And it's, you know, it's actually, I think we all want to do that, but it's, it's hard to do that. It takes discipline. It's easier to right. yell or to lecture because, A, that's how a lot of us were raised. Or B, you know, we want to protect them. So I, I love that. And I've been trying to do that, you know, when even just when my kids are telling a story is to just shut up, listen, nod your head, look them in the eye. And that will, you know, when the problems do get real, like when you're, when Dale is 18 and doing God knows what in his blue caravan, you know, you won't be as scared to come talk to him because that's when you're, you're really going to need your dad. Right. Absolutely, man. All right, Dale, let's mix it up here for a second. Are you ready for your rapid fire questions, Dale Dupree? Yeah, man, I'm ready for them. All right. What was your first car? Ah, uh, that blue Dodge Caravan that I was just talking about. You already answered it. You can, you're either a rock star <laughs> or, you know, a creep in a van at 18 driving a minivan. <laughs> yep, so pretty much. I'm glad to hear you're a rock star. What is your favorite meal to eat for dinner? Oh, I love, absolutely love bacon peanut butter sandwiches that I make on my cast iron skillet. What is your favorite movie of all time? We'll start with a drama. A drama that is my favorite movie would probably be The Godfather. What is your favorite comedy movie of all time? You know... It, this is a really tough one because you sent me these and I was I had to dwell on that one for a second and think, what is my favorite comedy movie? But what about Bob is probably the the funniest movie I've ever seen. So good. So good. Yes. What is your favorite <laughs> live concert you've ever seen? When I was 13 years old and it's kind of what kicked off my my career of of in the music world in general, just my lust for it. I went to go see Corn on the Family Values Tour with my best friend. <laughs> If you were a major league baseball player, Dale, what would be your walkout song? So I don't know that anybody's really going to know my walkout song, like the one that I would want it to be. So I'm going to make it my, my wife's, which is anything by little Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you were going to go with a corn, really hardcore metal song. <laughs> nah, but... like if, if young, if young money is playing on the overhead, then my wife is hype. And so that would get me hyped too. <laughs> I love it. What is your favorite podcast to listen to right now? So my, my favorite podcast of all time that I always listen to is the B2B Grow Show, which is hosted by James Carberry, which I'm a little biased because he's one of my best friends. Excellent. Excellent answers, Dale. I'll have to check that one out. Um, so talk a little bit about what is the sales rebellion? So the sales rebellion is a concept that I came up with at the beginning of this year, January of 2019, after I resigned from my position at a high ranking copier firm uh, in the central Florida area, where I decided that it was about time that instead of just kind of giving these methods and, and this madness that I had put together for myself over the last 13 plus years as a copier salesman, instead of kind of keeping it to me. I decided that I would, it was time to give it to others. And, and the big concept here is there's not a lot of training out there that helps other people to understand what their unique gifts are and to help other people to nurture and, and create success around um, their strengths and their weaknesses. A lot of times instead we try to teach people, you know, do X to get to Y, do A to get to C. And, and the idea behind that for me is that, yes, well, there's a structure inside of the sales rebellion system, but what we're really trying to do is to tap into people's authenticity. And really that authenticity typically rebels against the status quo. And that's what we're really teaching people to do at the end of the day is to say, 
you know, hey, look, it's cool that you have all these KPIs and things that your boss is making you do, but you can still have fun in sales. You can still be yourself in sales. You can still tap into your community on a relational level instead of just a transactional level. And so that's kind of it in a nutshell. Excellent. So you're doing sales training across the country. I see you're you're huge on LinkedIn. You're you're an excellent writer, very compelling, always funny. <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Sales training and development is typically what we do for one-on-one clients. We also do group coaching for companies, on-site training as well as remote, you know, kickoffs. But what's real unique about us and that's gonna start rolling out, uh, which is my vision is we're going to actually put together and, and we, it's in beta, right? It's about to go into beta right now as an app that, that salespeople can essentially spend for, uh, you know, the same amount that they would at the gym to get self-development, you know, throughout, throughout the month and throughout the year, uh, through sales training. And, and really it's, it's, it's gamified. It's about making sales fun again for people. It's about helping people to, to understand the focus that they need to have in sales, community, culture, people, and, and also the concept of, the mundane and the monotonous. Like we, we, we both know that like you, to be a good salesperson, you have to make cold calls, right? But nobody likes to do that. And so what do we, what is it that we tap into for people to help them to understand that it can be fun and it can be, it can, and not just for you, but for your prospect too, right? So we just take a different approach and we're trying to get people to understand that they also don't have to spend a thousand dollars a month to get good sales training. They can spend $24 a month instead and be a part of a community. So that's really what we're working toward is being more, being more of a light, for people and not being this high ticket item that, you know, you've got to pay for because it's in such a high demand. Like we want to give back to our community. Yeah. I mean, there is such a need for that. And, you know, everybody out there, we want to be entertained, you know, we want to be connected with. So I think that is one of your strong points. So that is something I would definitely sign up for. You'll have to let me know when that is in beta. I'd love to join. (laughs) Awesome. Can you give uh, listeners out there maybe one quick sales tip that, that we could use today? Yes. You know, my favorite to always tell people, especially when I talk to them for the first time, is to start thinking about the principle of curiosity and causing undeniable curiosity in your marketplace. You know, Think about the 17 other salespeople that call the same prospects as you on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. Like, How are you differentiating yourself for your prospect to make sure that they even remember your name in the first place? How are you causing curiosity? How are you building a long-term sales career and overcoming you know, short-term gratif- instant gratification that is not lasting and that, that fails in the first place? So curiosity would be the big tip that I would, I, would, I would throw out there to your audience. Start thinking about how you're causing it in your local marketplace. So what's an example you could give of that? Let's say you're, you're calling me up. I'm running a big law firm or something, or I'm answering the phone, what's an example that could pique my curiosity and, and get Dale in the door? Sure. Yeah, I love that. So we, we, let, me, let me give it to you real straight here. We have a system called Reason, which is to radically educate and share one's narrative. That's kind of the short form of it. When you break it down, the acronym, when you break it down long form, it's radically educate, attention, story, outline, and nuance. And what we teach reps is how to essentially share their reason through this structure with each and every single individual that they're calling on so that they have a better chance of getting either a real, like the best no they've ever gotten or which for example, I have a prospect or a, uh, a student that just called on one of their prospects at Duke university. <laughs> it's a really high level person too, that they've never really been able to kind of get a hold of yet in this particular outreach, they got an email back that said, man, I wish we didn't have an internal department that already did this because this is the best outreach I've ever received in my life. So, and the, the thing is, is that we get, we get stories like this on a daily basis and kind of sit back me and my team and just think, why don't more people do this? And, and this is what it is. This is how, how, how we break it down. Radical education. How are you radically educating your prospect? And so what we do is we teach people what we call an FTP, which is a first touch piece. Right now, if you head over to my LinkedIn, either on my personal page, which is linkedin.com slash IN slash copier warrior, or you head over to the sales rebellion on LinkedIn. Um, and actually any of my social sites, we're running a, a, a literal campaign right now, which we call the letter campaign. The example that you're asking for is in that letter campaign. And there's a free download. So everybody listening, how curious are you right now to go and check it out? I like what you did there. You're piquing my curiosity. You don't tell me. (laughs) You don't tell me what it is. You're going to make me go get there. And I I love it. I'm already hooked. You bait the hook. 
So Dale, I found you on, we talked a little bit about LinkedIn. I know you're a, you're a beast on there, your stories, your engagement, everything is really admirable and compelling stuff. For people out there that are maybe just getting started on LinkedIn, can you talk a little bit about what are the benefits that everybody should be on there and cultivating a presence and maybe some tips for someone just getting started that's a little intimidated by social media and LinkedIn and specifically? Of course, of course. So LinkedIn is interesting. And, and what's what I think is even more interesting is just like six months ago, guys like Gary V, you know, the top of the food chain have started to say, you need to be on LinkedIn, right? So I've been on LinkedIn for, gosh, it was, I think I, I activated my profile in 2010. Um, and, and the reason I did is because I remember I played in a band, right? So I was, I was actually on MySpace and Friendster. Like those were the two like social platforms I can remember. And I used those to promote my band. It's actually how we got, ended up getting signed on the Pluto records and then eventually Warner brothers. And, and I saw this, the power of social media. I saw the idea and the concept of algorithms being like from an organic perspective, being able to get you a very far reach and, and one that was very unique as well too, because the people that are typically on these platforms, they're either self-seeking. And so they're trying to find, you know, sales for themselves or somebody that they can prospect for themselves or they're looking for information. They're looking for knowledge and both of those you can captivate. You know, so what I did with my, uh, with my journey on LinkedIn is that eventually I started using content to attract both parties where people that were self-seeking, they, they came to my post because of how much interaction I was getting, but they ended up, what, what most of them will come to me and say is that, you know, I, I like coming to your page to see all the, the conversations with all these C-level executives that are saying like, this will never work. And then, you know, some of them that are like, this is brilliant. And then other ones that are like my customers that were showing up in the comments and saying, y'all need to chill out. Like Dale did this stuff and I gave him all my business. Right. So it was real interesting in the beginning to kind of see how things played out. But the bottom line being that everybody has this little piece inside of them that is inherently curious, kind of like we were just talking about. And if you're posting content that gets good engagement because you're captivating people in those first sentences. They're looking at them and they're saying, what else is, you know, what else is he talking about here? And like, how could this help me? Cause it, that's what a lot of people are thinking when it comes to content consumption. Well, there's 600 million plus people on LinkedIn right now that are, you know, not all active, but they're out there. There's a majority of those users out there looking through the feed, looking for hope and inspiration and opportunity. And, and the best part is, is that, for example, like my content organically, I mean, it gets anywhere between 50 and 100,000 views uh, daily. So just depending, again, like on the quality of the post, on how many people actually engage with it, there's lots of little pieces of the puzzle. But imagine you listening right now, being able to go from, you know, the 20 or so people that you can talk to a day to hitting six figures and people that are, that are organically viewing your content and becoming healthily indoctrinated by you and what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And if it's in the name of service and in the name of your community and in the name of growth for those that you surround yourself with, your tribe, right, then you will have great success. And so for the last two years, that's what I've been focused on, building my tribe, finding my people and serving them. And it's been extremely rewarding. Um, hopefully monetarily at some point in my life, <laughs> but you know, the big piece of it that, that, that I, I can't get enough of bro is just hearing from kids and, and then four months later having them come back and say, bro, I've been doing what you've been saying and my life has changed. You know, those are the kind of things that I think honor my father just as much as they honor the rebellion and what we stand for. And that's what, again, I cherish and I, I hold dear to my heart and it all starts on a business platform that you can post content on. Right. I mean, it's kind of crazy to think about. It all starts with selling copy machines. Right. I mean, these are things that stereotypically would be, you know, you'd have a very generic outlook of them. Like a copy machine makes copies. No, a copy machine leads to a very, very fruitful relationship between two people. <laughs> like that's literally what happens. Right. And content is the same way through, through LinkedIn. So if you're just getting started on LinkedIn and it, you're not good at content, you don't have to post it. You can just head to other people's content and you can start engaging inside of the comments. That will get you visual, um, that'll get you that capture concept where visually people will come, they'll see your opinion on something that they agree with or disagree with, right? And, and then you'll start to spark further conversations. You'll start to get people looking at you as you know, somewhat of a thought leader to, to an extent, right? It's not always right away, but 
when people start to crave, you know, oh, what did what did Rob say inside of this post? When people start to think like that, you've taken it to the next level. And LinkedIn is the place to do that. That's awesome. And I, I imagine, like everybody, it can be kind of intimidating when I see Gary V and you with all these likes and comments, but everybody does have to start from zero and you can't, you know, easy to say not to be results oriented, you know, when you put all your time into a post and you get no, you get crickets, it can be a little bit, uh, you know, damaging to your ego and demotivating, sure. but yeah. you would say just to stick with it. And I mean, that's the other thing that I find, I was never really a social media person, but I do find LinkedIn much more compelling and interesting, but you know, the whole idea of being on it all the time. I mean, do you structure how you use it when you use it? Or do you have any like suggestions of people that are a little bit scared to go on? Because I think there are a lot of people out there that are, you know, intimidated by mm -hmm. these social platforms right. or. Uh, yeah. I w well, so I would say like structure is important, but I would, you know, when you were talking about being deflated, you know, inside of your content posting, like because nobody really engaged it or you didn't get many DMs because of it. This is the thing is that like in sales and anybody listening that's in sales and everybody's in sales, bro, just to clarify that even buyers and the concept here is, is that if you're not consistent and if you were just to walk away after, you know, reaching out to somebody and not hearing back and giving up, that's, that's what, 99% of salespeople fail because of, right? So the concept here with content is the same. It's that it doesn't matter if you got any traction on that first post, that second post, that hundredth post. What matters is that you keep showing up because by that 200th post or that 600th post, I think I'm somewhere in the thousands at this point. I don't even, I lost count, bro, at, at, at this point. But when you've got that much content, you know, there's a lot more that it can that it can do for you too than just get people's attention in the moment on the day you post it. It can be repurposed to podcasts. It can be repurposed to you know medium.com and a and a longer blog that you write that's more than 1,300 characters. It can be repurposed even inside of your your training methodologies or your or specifically in your presentations that you give to people. I mean, there's a there it is a vast amount of things that you could do with content in the first place. And so it's not just about getting success on the platform as much as it's about being super strategic about the content itself, what you're doing with it and how you're making it work for you. Right. And listen, like even if two people liked your post, you should be engaging those two people, right? You should be hitting them up personally and saying, Hey, thanks for getting into my post and, and showing me some love. What do you do? Right. And start to show curiosity towards those that you're trying to cultivate relationships with online because they turn to offline, bro. I'll tell you right now that when I travel around the United States, I get to meet up with some of the most amazing people that would never had the opportunity to do so if I had to take in the leap and then I sucked it up, you know, when things were rough or it wasn't working the way I wanted to, you know, and persevering instead of giving up. So don't give up people. That's my best lesson. No, it's great advice. And I think a lot of it is just, you know, getting the reps in, whether it's daily or weekly, but not even necessarily looking at your likes and, and caring too much about that. But, you know, and it's also fun to create content. So if you do just keep putting it out there, it'll become a, a habit. Great. And like you said, you're planting seeds that even if a couple you meet a couple people, it can be very valuable. Right. Uh, I do have to ask you real quick before you leave. You say you're getting up at 4.30. I hear so much about morning <laughs> routines, and it can be frustrating right. when you hear the uh, Tim Ferrisses of the world. So I'm always admiring dads that are pulling it off. What is the key to it? And I guess a lot of it is what time are you going to bed or how much sleep are you getting that you're, that you're able to be a machine at 4.30 a.m.? Yeah, you know, and like I got a big opinion on it because I do believe in the health side, like the holistic side especially. You know, like sleep is super important. Um, I don't. I don't down that by any means, but I also believe that time is extremely important. And it's, it's the, if we would start to look at routines and you know, the, what time we go to bed more, more seriously and from a different perspective of time itself and not necessarily about what, what helps us, but what's going to be the best thing for our family and the experiences we give them, what's going to be the best thing for our prospect and the experiences we give them when it comes to time, our focus will be so it, well, here's what happens, I should say, is that you get set on fire and nobody can put it out. And so let's say that, you know, two or three nights out of a week, you've got to stay up a little bit later to get some things done. It's not about 
having to quote unquote, get some things done. It's about being fired up to keep going and then waking up four and a half hours later. That's not healthy for your body, but bro, let me tell you right now that it literally in the morning when I only get four and a half hours of sleep, you just sworn that someone threw gasoline on me, you know, on the fire that I already had because it's like a blaze at that point. You know, the whole house is burning down when I get out of bed because I'm excited. I'm happy to be doing what I'm doing. I, I, I think about my legacy. I think about my son. I think about my father. I think about my wife. I think about my spirituality. I think about the things that are important to me in this walk, the people that I can affect today, how I can help my community, how I can serve, you know, not just the people that are doing business with me, but those that I run into those that are standing on the street corner crossing at the same time as me. Every instance of being able to speak and breathe life back into somebody else's is important to me. And, and because of that, my morning routine is easy. You know, and, and listen, here's the other thing that people need to hear is that you don't have to wake up at 4.30 in the morning. You know, you could wake up at 10. But here's the thing is that somebody else is awake at 4.30 and they're winning right? They're, they're out there and they're ahead of everybody else. And so you have to have that mindset. So if you're sleeping, you better be dreaming of winning. <laughs> That's what I tell people. But the idea again is it's about what do you do with the time when you have it, right? And so for me, like I like to be super prepared. I like waking up that early because I get to serve in, the, in, in that capacity. I get to fly through my, my scroll through my, my LinkedIn feed and, and interact with other people, which I don't get to do during the day because I'm too busy, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So it's that concept. It's, it's what is our commitment to ourself? And, and be flexible with yourself, people. Like if, you, if you're trying to wake up every morning at 4.30, give yourself an hour. You know, say, well, I'm going to try to wake up at 4.30 and if I don't, I'm going to wake up by 5.30, right? Mm -hmm. You know, just be flexible. Like know who you are. Like knowing thyself is one of the most important principles that we can we can understand and live by in our walk. It will help so much better for you to understand, you know, the seven secrets to a, an amazing morning <laughs> habit. You know, like that's all bull crap. And anybody that's telling you that they can change your life with their habits is stupid. You should be looking inward and saying, what is it that's going to fuel me? What excites me? What's going to make me want to be up at this time? And then how can I discipline myself, you know, to be able to keep consistencies inside of this, you know, even if every once in a while I met, I miss it, like give yourself permission to, to screw up. It's okay. Embrace the suck. It will help you to become better. No, oh, it's so inspiring, Dale, to hear you. And it, it's awesome to hear how much of it, you know, you learned from your dad and you'll pass on to your kids. So I really appreciate you being on the Dad the Best I Can podcast. Tell people where they can get more Dale in their life. You can get more Dale on every social platform. SalesRebellion.com is where it all starts. You can find my podcast, Selling Local, on any of your major podcast platforms. LinkedIn, you can find me searching for Dale Dupree or LinkedIn.com backslash IN backslash Copier Warrior. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, at sales rebellion facebook at sales rebellion or search dale dupree for my personal page i'd love to have you there too you're everywhere i got it oh you said the copier warrior that reminded me i'm sure you've seen the saturday night live skit with the uh, rich meister was that oh, part okay. of your uh, yeah. repertoire dale <laughs> making copies <laughs> not quite but i definitely used it in some of my inside jokes for sure inside <laughs> of my presentation so awesome Good all right, Dale, thanks for being on. I uh, look forward to talking to you soon and seeing, seeing you on LinkedIn. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure, Rob. Thanks for having me. Thank you guys for listening to the Dad the Best I Can show. Go take five seconds, hop on over to dadthebestican.com and sign up with your email to get weekly updates, dad tips in your mailbox, get your questions answered on the show. That's dadthebestican.com. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and leave us a five-star rating on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. Actually, five stars. We could do better than that. Brooks? Infinity. Infinity stars. Cameron, how many stars? Infinity thousand. Infinity thousand. You got to one-up them in this household. Thanks. See you.